Welcome to the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 1 to 11 by Venerable Katakurunda Nyanananda, an e learning course hosted by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg in collaboration with the Barrett Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we are going to look at sermon number eight. But before coming to that, a few comments related to the online discussion on the forum in relation to the last sermon. But two comments I wanted to share, one by Hedwig Krenn. She said, I found the comparative perspective in the beginning of the sermon about Pabang and Pahang extremely useful because it shows, as Venerable Damadina pointed out sharply in Forum 6, how important it is for our attempt to get to the true meaning of the word of the Buddha that have come down to us. And Jeff Harding, I especially appreciate your comments on how you view your contributions to our understanding of early Buddhism by comparative studies. Yes, it is as if the knowledge of parallel versions now allows us to see with both eyes instead of one what the Buddha was teaching. However, we must also admit that we still are viewing the teachings through our pair of eyes which suffer from macular degeneration. At the very least, separation from the Buddha by time and culture will always leave us with speculation about certain aspects of the Dharma. I thought that was very, very, very good point that uh, Jeff made here. And uh, there is certainly always an element of subjectivity in the way we will approach and interpret certain passages. But my personal feeling is that the comparative study and uh, what we call the historical critical perspective on the suttas that we cultivate in the academic setting is a very important checking point for such subjectivity. What comes to my mind is, for example, Caroline Rice Davids, who, if I may simplify that a little bit, who was so uh, much taken by the Buddha and thought that he was just such a wonderful person, how could he possibly have missed out on something as important as the self, the soul? And so, based on this premise, she then reads through the suttas and everything where we get a reference to anatta or not self, then that is just very obviously a later addition by those monkish editors who did not really appreciate and understand the profound meanings of the Buddha. And I think, uh, I suppose you all will be smiling, but at the time when she wrote that, she was quite serious about it. And she's not the only one. She's actually quite, quite a good scholar otherwise. And I mean, other scholars have made such suggestions. And also in my own experience, particularly in the West with Buddhist practitioners, we often come across uh, comparable uh, statements or positions where the basic procedure seems to be somewhat like uh, one has a certain idea about uh, the teachings and one is so firmly convinced that this idea must be what, uh, what the Buddha originally taught and then this leads to a kind of a cherry picking when reading through the textual material, usually only from one tradition, only the Pali tradition. And anything that does not accord with that uh, idea is then obviously dismissed as late, that it can't be, can't be the true thing. And this is uh, unsound and basically just cherry picking. And there are different methodologies. I mean, some then, for example, pick out a particular section from the whole collections. A good example is the Atakavaga of the Sutta Nipata and then pretend that they are reconstructing a sort of pre-canonical Buddhism, uh, Buddhism that does not know anything about the Four Noble Truths or uh, various other things, 
and or others just 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 pick a few passages here and there and and construct some idea but these are uh, this 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 tendency to give free range to, to, to subjective notions and opinions is somewhat inhibited by this comparative approach. There is some reason why certain things are considered earlier or later, because the comparative study has shown up differences. And I think it is very important to, to, to follow some kind of methodology there. And another point that I think is also important is to avoid taking the uh, somewhat fundamentalist um, position that only what is found in the early suttas is valuable and everything else is simply not valuable. I have uh, discussed this whole issue in an interview that was actually also conducted at the Barris Center for Buddhist Studies, the same organization that is also co-hosting this online course and I think the interview is up on YouTube so anybody could look at it who is interested. It's called something like respecting the different Buddhist traditions. And I think with all the natural interest and concern we have to come to a proper understanding of early Buddhism in the sense of coming as close as possible within the limitations of the textual sources at our disposition and our own subjectivity so nicely pointed out by Jeff that we have to avoid taking the stance that only what we can attribute to early Buddhism is uh, correct and forms a proper basis for practice or understanding of Buddhism and everything else is simply to be dismissed as some sort of later degeneration. I think this is practically almost impossible to carry through, for one. And it also misses out on all the beauty and interesting new perspectives that came up in the ensuing 2,500 years in the development of Buddhism up to today. And it is also problematic in so far as it then forces almost inevitably the need to attribute anything that I personally find useful to early Buddhism in order for me to feel justified to, to, to practice it. I mean a very very good example talking from meditation practice and something that has also come up in the Nibbana sermons are the insight knowledges. This is obviously a later scheme. It is not found in the suttas. But at the same time, it's just so incredibly useful. And for many, uh, it has provided important reference point for navigating the progress, the meditation progress towards the experience of stream entry. That uh, to dismiss it simply because in its fully formulated form it is not found in the uh, early Buddhist teachings would be somewhat absurd. But at the same time, then, uh, if, if I take this fundamentalist position, I would be forced to try to construct in some way that it has been there and maybe uh, overlooked or whatever to, to get into some sort of argumentation in order to prove that this system is already in early Buddhism. But it seems to my mind so much simpler to simply see no, it is uh, not an early Buddhist teaching. It has developed based on a pattern of the three characteristics that we find in early Buddhism, but in its fully formulated form, it is only found in later texts. But that doesn't mean it is not useful. It's very simple. And we can get out of this, this what I really consider a fundamentalist move, this attempt to attribute everything that we find useful or acceptable to early Buddhism. Yeah, that was what I had on this point. And then I wanted to clarify again also what uh, what the comparative study that uh, from the last lecture implies and what it does not imply. Because maybe that has not become entirely clear. 
maybe this is just my own fault, uh, lack of clarity in my presentation. So the what emerges from a close study regarding the Anita Sanavignana? We have two occurrences of this term. One is in the Brahmani Mantanika Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 49. And there, all Pali version have the reading Pabhang, luminous. However, except for the Burmese edition, the Pali editions read as if this were a statement made by Brahma. If that is the case, it could not be a Nibbanic experience. And the Chinese parallel clearly attributes the corresponding statement to Brahma. And in that corresponding statement, Pabhang, luminosity, does not occur at all. The other occurrence of the Anidasana Vijnana is in the Kevada Sutta, in the Diga Nikaya. And here we have considerable evidence to suppose that the more original reading would have been Pahang, not Pabhang. That is not a reference to luminosity. And the only parallel where luminosity does occur, which is in the Dirga Agama, immediately follows that with the reference to cessation. So in the Dirga Agama version, the disappearance or not having a footnote or cessation of the four elements and name and form takes place with the cessation of the luminous consciousness. And in the other version, it seems much rather that there is some Pahang understood in different ways. So this is this this whole comparison is nothing whatsoever against or about the non-manifestative consciousness. This is clearly a reference in the Kevada Sutta. It must be a reference to a nibbanic experience, because otherwise the four elements would not cease. The name and form ceases. Vinyana, Sanyarodina, Etteta, Uparujati, the final part. This is clearly a reference to Nibbana, and th th this is not at all being put into question. The only question that is being made is how far does this relate to the idea of luminosity? And this is doubtful. And the other reference to Pabhasara. It's not exactly the same Pabha and Pabhasara. They have a similar meaning but stem from different roots. The reference to Pabhasara are reference to Samadhi experiences. And the famous passage that uh, uh, the mind is uh, luminous and defiled by adventitious defilements and uh, whirling does not understand that and therefore there is no uh, chitta bhavana is no uh, cultivation of the mind for the worldly. This is uh, somewhat problematic. And here there's a ref men, ref uh, something from Hedwig again uh, on, on this particular passage. She asked, how can the chitta of someone who is entangled with defilements and whose whirlpool of consciousness and nama rupa is spinning round and round in this bottomless abyss, abyss be luminous? This does not really make sense to me. Maybe it could be interpreted as someone who experiences the luminosity of the mind via the jhana or immaterial attainments or even the Brahma Viharas and does not understand that the mind is still defiled and that this is only the prerequisite practice to calm the mind, make it soft and pliant and then move on to the eradication of the asavas. Yeah, and I here also uh, see... Uh, other problems with this uh, passage on the uh, Pabhasara Chitta. One is that the expression Agantuka that the uh, Upakalesas have sort of come to it, it almost could give the impression as if the luminous mind is sort of a pre existing condition. And the defilements sort of come to it later. And that's a little bit difficult because the opakilesas cannot really exist apart from the mind. They are not something, uh, this is actually different from the simile of gold that is sometimes used 
where there is actually other defilements like sand on top of it. But the opakiles is the defilements, they only exist in the mind. They are not something that comes from the outside and then is on top of the mind. And the idea behind that could be, and this is the way how I would relate it, there is this cosmological myth in early Buddhist teachings about the is a circular event where the whole planet and uh, is uh, burning up uh, a conflagration and at that time all beings because the whole planet has been consumed by fire uh, uh, because beings have no other place to be reborn everybody will be reborn in the abhasara brahman Loka. This corresponds to the second absorption and everybody will be beings that are luminous abha and after some time when the universe evolves again then beings from that abhasara uh, world will be reborn on this jambudipa or this uh, uh, world as luminous beings feeding on joy and this is described in Aganya Sutta and then uh, these luminous beings are a little bit greedy and they start to taste uh, the flavor of the earth which is very, very flavorsome and as they keep eating it they, be, they acquire more gross material bodies and eventually they become human beings so this is a kind of cosmological creation or, evo creation or evolution myth and so if we relate it to that, then uh, in a sense, all of us included, uh, at some point in the past, we have been these luminous beings living in a condition comparable to the second absorption, just feeding on joy and happiness. And uh, then there has been a downfall into the material world by partaking of material food and slowly then developing gross desires and etc. However, this does relate to Pabha and Pabhasara, the Abha beings, but this is not a condition of being free from all Upakilesas because, I mean, for one, we can see that these beings, when they have the chance, they manifest greed. And even while they are living in the Abhasara Loka, it is said that sometimes when this, when a very strong conflagration happens and the fire is very high, then beings who have newly come to this Abhasara Loka, they are, they are, they are afraid. They have a lot of fear that this world, their world will also be burned up. And those who have lived there for a longer time and have seen this happening earlier, then say, no, no, don't be afraid. That's a huge fire, but it won't reach all the way up to here. Uh, and so fear is one of the Upakilesas. In fact, in Upakilesa Sutta, Majimanika Hana 28, it is explicitly identified as an Upakilesa that prevents uh, uh, the inner experience of light. Obhasa is also related to Bhas. Uh, Obhasa in Dasanancharupan, and so uh, the perception of light and or luminosity and inner vision of forms. So this this would not really work as an understanding of the Pabhasara Chitta in the sense of being just free from any defilements, any upakilesa. And that would also not work so well for the idea we get in a number of suttas that uh, samsara is without a discernible um, beginning point, Anamataku Samsara. There is no point at which one can say there was no ignorance and it only came into being. And another problem I see with the um, passage on the Pabhasara Chitta in Anguttara Nikaya is also the stipulation that knowledge of the luminous mind is a precondition for Chitta Bhavana. It says very clearly that the uh, Asutta Bhaputujana, the untaught worldling, uh, does not understand as it really is this Pabhasa Chitta and therefore there is no Chitta Bhavana for him, no cultivation of the mind. And Chitta Bhavana in the suttas is used in a very general way, not only for the cultivation of mental tranquility 
and so it would not really work to uh, visualize or to assume that all manifestations of citta bhavana in the suttas have as their precondition the recognition of this luminous mind. I think that is all I had by way of getting us winding up things from the last sermon. And so now we get into sermon number eight. Etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato sab upadi patinis sango tanhakan kayogi rago nirudho nibbanam. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. The other day we ended our sermon by discussing how far the Brahmani Mantanika Sutta of the Majmanikaya helps us to understand what Anidasana Vijnana is. We quoted a certain paragraph from that discourse as a starting point for our discussion. Let us now remind ourselves of it. Vijnanang Anidasanang Anantang Sabbatopabhang Tang Pativeya Patavitena An Anubhutang Apasa <laughs> Subakin hanang subakinatin ananubhutang. We have palanang, we have palatin ananubhutang. Abi busa abi butin ananubhutang. Sabbasa sabatin ananubhutang. Consciousness which makes nothing manifest, infinite and all lustrous. It does not partake of the earthiness of earth, the wateriness of water, the fieriness of fire, the airiness of air the creaturehood of creatures, the devahood of devas, the pajapatihood of pajapati, the brahmahood of brahma, the radiance of the radiant ones, the subakinahood of the subakina brahmas, the vihapampalahood of the vihapala brahmas, the overlordship of the overlord and the allness of the all. Comment here the translation by Nyanamoni. Consciousness non-manifestating, boundless, luminous all around that is not partaken of by the earthness of earth, that is not partaken of by the waterness of water, that is not partaken of by the allness of all. End of comment. The gist of this paragraph is that the non-manifestative consciousness, which is infinite and all lustrous, is free from the qualities associated with any of the concepts in the list, such as the earthiness of earth and the wateriness of water. That is to say, it is not under their influence. It does not partake of them. Ananubhutam. Whatever nature the word attributes to these concepts, whatever reality they invest it with, that is not registered in this non-manifestative consciousness. That is why this consciousness is said to be uninfluenced by them. Usually the worldlings attribute a certain degree of reality to concepts in everyday usage. These may be reckoned as mind objects, things that the mind attends to. The word Dhamma also means a thing. So the worldling thinks that there is something in each of these concepts. Or, in other words, they believe that there is something as an inherent nature or essence in these objects of the mind. But the quotation in question seems to imply that this so-called nature is not registered in the Arahant's mind. It is extremely necessary for the worldling to think that there is some real nature in these mind objects. Why? Because in order to think of them as objects, they have to have some essence. At least they must be invested with an essence, and so the worldlings do invest them with some sort of an essence. And that is the earthiness of earth, the wateriness of water, etc. Likewise, there is a beinghood in beings a devahood in deva, a pajapatihood in pajapati, a brahmahood in brahma, so much so that even the concept of all, there is an allness, 
and this is the worldling's standpoint. Attributing a reality to whatever concept that comes up, the worldlings create for themselves perceptions of permanence, perceptions of the beautiful and perceptions of self. In other words, they objectify these concepts in terms of craving, conceit and views. That objectification takes the form of some inherent nature attributed to them, such as earthiness, neighborhood, etc. But as for the non-manifestative consciousness, it is free from the so-called natures that delude the worldlings. In the consciousness of the Arahants, there is not that infatuation with regard to the mass of concepts which the worldlings imagine as real, in order to keep going this drama of existence. This fact is clearly borne out by another statement in the Brahmanimantanika Sutta. The Buddha makes the following declaration to break the conceit of Bhakta the Brahma, who conceived the idea of permanence regarding his status as a Brahma. Patavin kuang brahme patavito abhinyaya yavata pataviya patavitena ananubhuta tattapinyaya patavin na hosin pataviya na hosin patavito na hosin patavimeti na hosin patavin nabivadin. Having understood through higher knowledge, earth as earth, O Brahma, that is to say, having understood by means of a special kind of knowledge and not by means of the ordinary sense perception, and having understood through higher knowledge whatever that does not partake of the earthiness of earth, the reference here is to that non-manifestative consciousness, which is to be described in the passage to follow. I did not claim to be earth, pataving na hosin. I did not claim to be on earth, pataviyana hosin. I did not claim to be from earth, patavituna hosin. I did not claim earth as mine, pataving meti na hosin. I did not assert earth, pataving nabivadin. Comment in translation by Nyanamoni. Brahma, having directly known earth as earth, and having directly known that which is not partaken of the earthness of earth, I did not claim to be earth. I did not claim to be in earth. I did not claim to be apart from earth. I did not claim earth to be mine. I did not affirm earth. Yeah, this last part of the statement is probably the more significant one than the one about not partaking of the earthness of earth, etc. On adopting the reading that suggests itself from the different Pali editions, the majority, and from the Chinese parallel, in the sense that the Anidasana Vijnana uh, would be a statement made by Brahma. The sense that then emerges from that reading for the progression of the Brahmani Mantanika Sutta would be that in this competition of claims to all pervasive knowledge, between the Buddha and the Brahma. The Buddha makes the statement uh, that uh, he has this direct knowledge of earth. It is a knowledge that does not partake of the earthness of earth, etc. And the most significant part is that he does not claim to be earth, on earth, from earth, earth is mine, etc. These last parts point to his absolute non-identification, the realization of not-self, not appropriating any of these. And they are similar to uh, an exposition we find in the first discourse of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, where the Buddha and also the Arahant, this is perceptively the way how they perceive things without owning them, without identifying with them. In the Brahmani Mantanika Sutta, then the point seems to be that the Brahma tries to equal the Buddha by claiming that he also does not partake of the earthness of earth, etc. But he does not repeat the rest of the claims, the claims about uh, uh, non identification and non appropriation. This is evidently beyond his vision. So he just states, like, I have this experience, this uh, luminous consciousness 
which does not partake of the various things that you said you don't partake of, I, I get the same. And then he says, uh, by way of proving that uh, he is superior to the Buddha, then he says, no, I'm going to vanish from your, from your side. I'm going to disappear. And the Buddha says, you try. And the Brahma tries and he is unable to vanish. And then the Buddha does the same and he is able to vanish from the vision of Brahma. And uh, he is able to make himself invisible to them and at the same time have his voice be heard. And so in this way he proves to them that his realization is superior to that of Brahma. In the Madhyama Agama uh, version, the sequence is slightly different. But the main point that emerges is the same. That is the key aspect where the Buddha's penetrative knowledge is superior to the experience that Brahma claims to have had with his infinite consciousness is precisely the absence of ownership, any sense of ownership or any sense of identification to earth, water, fire, etc. End of comment. The declensional forms given here are also suggestive of the fact that once the world links attribute some inherent nature to those concepts in terms of a ness, as in earthiness, and make them amenable to their cravings, conceits and views, declensional forms come into usage, a few instances of which have been mentioned here. So with regard to this earth, one can conceive of it as my earth, or as I am on earth, or I am who am on the earth, or from the earth. <coughs> By holding on tenaciously to these declensional forms of one's own creation, one is only asserting one's ego. Now, for instance, we all know that what is called a flower is something that can fade away. But when one conceives of it as the flower I saw, and thereby appropriates it into the concept of an eye, it gets invested with the nature of permanence, since it can be recalled, and I've added in brackets here, as something appropriate by an eye. A perception of permanence which enables one to think about it again arises out of it. This is the idea behind the above reference. Comment. I added a little comment here in square brackets to mark it off clearly from the original text but in order to facilitate understanding this is at least what i understand the venerable is intending to say here and i think we simply have to keep in mind that in an oral presentation sometimes uh, something one says uh, does not come about over as clearly and unmistakably as it would be in an in a written presentation and so I, I thought I'd take the liberty and a few points to just add something in square brackets to convey at least the sense that I understand the passage in order to avoid misunderstandings because the very fact that something can be recorded as such does not necessarily imply a nature of permanence or even a belief in permanence Arahants and Buddhas obviously also recall, and that doesn't mean that they believe in anything permanent. But I think the point is, as mentioned in the previous sentence, the issue of appropriating what is being recalled as an expression, manifestation of an I. End of comment. <coughs> It is in the nature of the least mind not to take these concepts seriously. It does not have a tenacious grasp on these declensional forms. It is convinced of the fact that they are mere conventions in ordinary usage. Due to that conviction itself, it is not subject to them. I did not claim to be earth. I did not claim to be on earth. I did not claim to be from earth. I did not claim earth as mine. I did not assert earth. Pataving Navi Vadin. Here the word abhivadin is suggestive of conceit. The three terms abhinandati, abhivadati and anjusaya titti are often mentioned together in the discourses. Abhinandati means delighting in particular, which is suggestive of craving. Abhivadati means an assertion by way of conceit. 
an assertion which implies a taking up of something. Anjo Zaya Tiktati stands for dogmatic involvement regarding views. Thus Abhinandati, Abhivadati and Anjo Zaya Tiktati correspond to the three terms Tanha, craving, Mana, conceit and Titti, views, respectively. Now out of these what we find here is Abhivadati. Patavi nabi vadim. I did not assert earth. I did not make any assertion about earth by way of conceit. From these two, we can infer that the ordinary man in this world takes his perception of the earth seriously, and by conceiving of it as earth is mine, I am on the earth, etc., invests the concept with a permanent nature. But this is a kind of device the worldlings adopt in order to perpetuate the drama of existence. However, every one of these elements is void. In this particular context, the four elements earth, water, fire and air are mentioned at the very outset. The Buddha, having understood the emptiness and impermanence of these elements, does not cling to them. The ordinary worldling, on the other hand, clings to the perception of earth in a piece of ice because of its hardness. But as we know, when we heat it up to a certain degree, its watery quality reveals itself. Further heating would bring up its fiery nature. Continuous heating will convert it into a vapor, revealing its air quality. Thus the four great primaries, which the world clings to, also have the nature of impermanence about them. The emancipated one, who rightly understands this impermanence through his higher knowledge, does not get upset by their ghostly configurations. His consciousness is not subject to them. This is the import of the above paragraph. The same holds true with regard to the other concepts. Some sadic beings have their conventional usages. One might think of oneself as a god among gods. Now Bhaka the Brahma had the conceit, I am a Brahma. But even his Brahma status gets melted away like that piece of ice, at least after some eons. So even Brahmahood is subject to liquidation, like an ice cube. In this way, the released consciousness of the Arahant does not register a perception of permanence with regard to the concepts which masquerade as real in the worldling's drama of existence. That is why it is called non-manifestative consciousness. That non-manifestative consciousness is free from those concepts. By way of a further explanation of the nature of this released mind, we may drop a hint through the analogy of the film and the drama, which we have employed throughout. Now, for instance, in order to produce a tragic scene on the screen, the film producers adopt subtle devices and camera tricks. Sometimes an awe-inspiring scene of conflagration or ruthless arson, which drives terror into the hearts of the audience, is produced with the help of cardboard houses. Cardboard houses are set on fire, but the audience is hoodwinked into thinking that a huge mansion is on fire. Similarly, terrific traffic accidents are displayed on the screen with the help of a few toys. In this drama of existence, too, there are similar tragic scenes. Now, in spite of that tragic quality, if any member of the audience truly understands at that moment that these are cardboard houses and toys toppled from hilltops, he sees something comic in the apparently tragic. Likewise, in this drama of existence, there is a tragic aspect as well as a comic aspect. As a matter of fact, both these words, tragic and comic, can be accommodated within a highly significant term, some vega, anguish, sense of urgency. In trying to arouse some vega with regard to some karas or preparations, we could bring in both these attitudes. The ordinary whirling sees only the tragic side of the drama of existence, and then because of his ignorance. But the Arahant, the emancipated one, sees in this drama of existence a comic side as well. As an illustration, they may allude to those occasions in which the Buddha himself 
and those disciples with psychic powers, like Venerable Mahama Kalilana, are said to have shown a faint smile, Situ Pada, on seeing how beings in samsara are reborn in high and low realms according to their deeds, as in a puppet show. Of course, that spontaneous smile has nothing sarcastic or unkind about it, but all the same it gives us a certain hint. This spontaneous smile <coughs> seems to be the outcome of an insight into the comic aspect of this existential drama. The faint smile is aroused by the conviction of the utter futility and insubstantiality of the existential drama, seeing how beings who enjoy high positions come down to the level of hungry ghosts, peters, or even to lower realms in their very next birth. It is somewhat like the response of one who has correctly understood the impermanence and the illusory nature of things shown on a film screen. When one comes to think of this drama of existence, some sadic beings appear like puppets drawn upwards by the five higher fetters, Udam Bhagya Sanyojana, and drawn downwards by the five lower fetters, Udam Bhagya Sanyojana. They reappear more or less like puppets, manipulated up and down by strings, which are but the results of their own deeds. The wherewithal for the drama of existence is supplied by the four great primaries, the four basic elements of earth, water, fire and air. In the case of a film or a drama, sometimes the same object can be improvised in a number of ways to produce various scenes and acts. What in one scene serves as a sitting stool could be improvised as a footstool in another scene and as a table in yet another. Similarly, there is something called double acting in films. The same actor can delineate two characters and appear in different guises in two scenes. A similar state of affairs is to be found in this drama of existence. In fact, the Buddha has declared that there is not a single being in samsara who has not been one of our relations at some time or another. We are in the habit of putting down such relations to a distant past in order to avoid a rift in our picture of the world by upsetting social conventions. But when one comes to think of it in accordance with the Dhamma and also on the strength of certain well-attested facts, sometimes the male or the female baby cuddled by a mother could turn out to be your own dead father or mother. Such a strangely ludicrous position is to be found in the acts of this drama of existence. Usually the world is unaware of such happenings. Though ludicrous, the world cannot afford to laugh at it. Rather, it should be regarded as a sufficient reason for arousing an anguished sense of urgency. What a pity that we are subject to such a state of affairs. What a pity that we do not understand it because of the power of influxes and latencies, and thereby heap up defilements. <coughs> Such an awareness of the emptiness of all this can give rise to anguish. One can get some understanding on the lines of the signless, the unsatisfactory and the void by contemplating these facts. Comment I have put desireless, I think uh, that is instead of unsatisfactory. End of comment. One can also contemplate on the four elements how they are the beginning of a world period and how they get destroyed at the end of a world period, in the conflagration at the end of an eon. Likewise, when one comes to think of the state of persons or beings in general, in accordance with this fact of relationship, there is much room for anguish and a sense of urgency. It is because of all this that the Buddha sometimes declares, as in the discourse on the rising of seven suns, Satta Surya Sutta, that this is enough to get disenchanted with all preparations, enough to get detached from them, enough to get released from them. <coughs> we have been drawing upon a particular nuance of the term Sankara throughout, that is, as things comparable to those instruments temporarily improvised in a dramatic performance just for the purpose of producing various acts on the stage. 
It is the same with persons who are like actors playing the parts. Beings who are born in accordance with their karma entertain the conceit, I am a god, I am a Brahma. Once their karma is spent up, they get destroyed and are reborn somewhere or other. It is the same with those items used in a drama, such as the stool and the footstool. But the intriguing fact is that those in the audience, watching each of those acts, grasp as such whatever objects they see on the stage when they produce their individual dramas. We have already mentioned at the very outset that the final stage in the production of a drama is a matter for the audience and not for the theatricians. Each member of the audience creates a drama in his own mind, putting together all preparations. What serves as a stool in one act of the drama may be used as a footstool in the next. In the first instance, it sinks into the minds of the audience as a stool, and in the next as a footstool. It is the same in the case of beings and their relationships. It must have been due to this state of affairs and the drama of existence, which arouses anguish, that the Buddha makes the declaration in quite a number of discourses dealing with the topic of impermanence, including those which describe the destruction of the Ian. This is enough monks to get disenchanted with all preparations, to get detached from them, to get released from them. These preparations are comparable to a film reel, which is the basic requirement for the film of name and form shown on the screen of consciousness of beings in this world. As the world is regarded as a sort of stage, trees, beings and objects in our environment are like objects on the stage. But the intriguing fact about it is that the ordinary man in the world is unaware of the prepared nature as a framework. When one is watching a film, one becomes unaware of the fact that it is just something shown on the screen. At that moment it appears as something real and lifelike. It is about this apparent reality that the Buddha speaks when he utters the following lines in the Iti Uttaka. Jatang Bhutang Samuppanang Kattang Sankatam Aduvan. Born become a wisdom made up, prepared, and stable. Whatever pierces real in this world is actually made and prepared by Sankaras. It is the insubstantial nature, the permanent, unsatisfactory, and not self nature that is hinted at by these lines. The term Sankara is suggestive of some artificiality about this world. Everything that goes to make it up is a Sankara. The non-manifestative consciousness, which is aware of its impermanent nature, is therefore free from these preparations. It is free from those concepts which the worldlings cling to. It remains unshaken by their ghostly transfigurations. We come across four wonderful verses in the Andimutta Tiragata, which, though extremely simple, give us a deep insight into this freedom in the Arahant's mind. The story of Venerable Adimutta is a marvelous one. By going through a forest, Venerable Adimutta got caught by a band of robbers who were just getting ready to offer a human sacrifice to the gods. So they got hold of this Arahant as their victim. But he, the latter, showed no consternation. There was no fear or terror in his face. The bandit chief asked him why he is unmoved. Then the venerable Adimutta uttered a sort of a set of verses in reply. Out of them we may quote the following four significant verses: Natti chitasikang dukkang anapekkasagamani. Atikanta bahya sabbe kina sangyo janasuri. There is no mental pain to one with no expectations or headman. All fears have been transcended by one whose fetters are extinct. Nami hoti ahosinti bhavisanti nahoti me. Sankara vi bhavisanti tata ka paridevana. It does not occur to me I was, nor does it occur to me I will be. Mere preparations get destroyed. What is there to lament? Suddhang dhamma samuppadang suddhang sankhara santating 
भस्म तस् यथा भूतं न भयं होति गामनि the one who sees that it is the rising of pure dhammas and the sequence of pure preparations there is no fear or hidden tin katta samanglokam yadapanyaya phasati mamattang so asangbindam na intimiti nu suchati when one sees with wisdom this world as comparable to grass and twigs not finding anything worthwhile holding on his mind one does not grieve oh i have nothing comment here the translation by karen norman <coughs> there is no mental pain for one who is without longing shifting truly all fears have been overcome by one who has annihilated his fetters i do not have the thought i have been nor do i have the thought i shall be the constituent elements will cease to exist what lamentation will there be in respect of that there is no fear for one who sees as they really are the pure and simple arising of phenomena and the pure and simple cause of continuity of the constituent elements shifting when by wisdom one sees the world as being like grass and wood not finding possessiveness thinking it is not mine he does not grieve end of comment <coughs> at least a fraction of the gist of these four verses has already come up in some form or other in the sermons given so far now as for the first verse addressed to the bandit chief the first two lines say that there is no mental pain to one who has no expectations cravings or desire the next two lines state that one whose fetters are destroyed has transcended fears to begin with let us get at the meaning of this verse here it is said that there is no mental pain not in tichitasikang dukkang in an earlier sermon based on the chitana sutta we happen to mention that for one who does not take body word and mind as real there is no inward pleasure and pain ajhatang sukadukkam the relevant quotation is avinjaya tveva sesa viraga niruddha sukayuna hodi yang pachaya satam upanjati ajhatang sukadukkam savachana hodi sumano na hodi kettang tang na hodi vattong tang na hodi ayatanang tang na hodi adi karanam tang na hodi yang pachaya satam upanjati ajhatang sukadukkam comment just again the translation by bigo body but with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance that body does not exist conditioned by which that pleasure and pain arise in one internally that speech does not exist that mind does not exist that fear does not exist that sight does not exist that base does not exist that location does not exist conditioned by which that pleasure and pain arise in one internally and of comment with the complete fading away and cessation of ignorance the arahant has no notion of a body comment i have added clinging to a notion of a body this is again another place where i am trying to bring out the sense that i assume the vanmanyananda has in mind because the arahant of course has the notion of a body uh, even the Venerable Anuruddha is said to have practiced the four Satipatthana, and part of body contemplation is Atikayo, Tivapanasa Satipatthu Patitaoti, Yavadeva Nyanamataya Patisatimataya. To there is the body, one is mindful just for the continuity of uh, mindfulness and knowledge. So the notion of a body as such is also something that Arans or a Buddha would have. but i think the point is that he does not cling to a notion of a body as something a substantial a solid and entity end of comment that is he does not have a perception of a body like that of a worldling who takes it as such due to his perception of the compact gana sanya likewise that speech is not there sa vachana hoti the basic reason for speech preparation is the reality attributed to words and linguistic usages when for instance someone scolds us we are displeased displeased at it 
because of the reality given to those words. Similarly, that mind is not there, so mano nahoti. It is only the collocation of preparations which rise and cease that is conceived as my mind. Therefore, whatever field, sight, base or reason, owing to which there can arise inward pleasure and pain, is no longer there. If the bandits had actually killed him, he would not have had any mental pain, because he lets go before Mara comes to breath. This is the idea expressed in the first verse. As for the second verse, there too the idea of voidness is well expressed. The thought I was does not occur to me. The idea I am is not in me. Nor do I entertain the idea I will be. That is to say, it does not occur to me that I had a past or that I will have a future. It only occurs to me that preparations get destroyed. That was what happened in the past and will happen in the future. So what is there to lament? A very important idea emerges from these verses. Now this series of sermons is on the subject of Nibbana. We thought of giving these sermons because of the existing variety of conflicting views on Nibbana. There is no clear idea even about our goal not only among non-Buddhists, but even among Buddhists themselves. From these verses we can glean some important facts. Here the reference is to existence. This Arahant must have had numerous births as Pretas, Brahmas, gods and human beings. But he is not saying something false here. What is really meant by saying that it does not occur to me I was? Ordinary worldlings even those with higher psychic powers, when they see their past lives, think of it, I have added with conceit, as I was so and so in such and such a birth. Comment again, I have added uh, with conceit just to make clear the meaning that I believe the Venerable has in mind, because as he himself said, uh, an Aaron has had a numerous past birth and even the Buddha himself is said to recollect his past lives. I was of such a name and partook of such food in the past. So it's not a problem of uh, the recollection as such, but to do so that with the conceit I am, I was, I will be. End of comment. Sometimes one entertains a conceit at the thought, I was a god, I was a Brahma. If he had been an animal or a preta, he is somewhat displeased. Such is not the case with this Arahant. He sees that what was in the past is a mere heap of preparations, and what will be in the future is again a heap of preparations. It is like the case of that cinema goer who understands that whatever comes up in the film is artificially got up. It is a state of mind aroused by wisdom. So what is there to lament is the attitude resulting from it. On an early occasion, we happen to compare these preparations to a heap of windings and unwindings in existence. Now as to this process of winding and unwinding, we may take as an illustration the case of a rope. There is a winding and an unwinding in it. We can form an idea about the nature of this existence even with the help of a simple illustration. Nibbana has been defined as the cessation of existence. The Buddha says that when he is preaching about the cessation of existence, some people, particularly the Brahmins who cling to a soul theory, bring up the charge of nihilism against him. Not only those Brahmins and heretics believing in a soul theory, but even some Buddhist scholars are scared of the term Bhavani Ruddha, fearing that it leads to a nihilistic interpretation of Nibbana. That is why they try to mystify Nibbana in various ways. What is the secret behind this attitude? It is simply the lack of a clear understanding of the unique philosophy made known by the Buddha. Before the advent of the Buddha, the world conceived of existence in terms of per durable essence as being, Sat. So the idea of destroying that essence of being was regarded as annihilationism. It was some state of a soul conceived as I and mine. But according to the law of dependent arising made known by the Buddha, 
Existence is something that depends on grasping. Upadana panchaya bhavo. It is due to grasping that there comes to be an existence. This is the pivotal point in this teaching. In the case of the footstool referred to earlier, it became a footstool when it was used as such. If when the next act it is used to sit when it becomes a stool, when it serves as a table it becomes a table. Similarly, in a drama, the same piece of wood, which in one act serves as a walking stick to lean on, could be seized as a stick to beat with in the next act. In the same way, there is no essential thinghood in the things taken as real by the world. They appear as things due to craving, conceits and views. They are conditioned by the mind, but these psychological causes are ignored by the world. Once concepts and designations are superimposed on them, then they are treated as real objects and made amenable to grammar and syntax, so as to entertain such conceits and imaginings as, for instance, in the chair, on the chair, chair is mine, and so on. Such a tendency is not there in the released mind of the Arahant. He has understood the fact that existence is due to grasping. Generally, in the explanation of the law of dependent arising, the statement dependent on grasping becoming is supposed to imply that, one, that one's next life is due to one's grasping in this life. But this becoming is something that goes on from moment to moment. Now, for instance, what I'm now holding in my hand has become a fan because I'm using it as a fan. Comment, this is the, refers to the traditional way of giving a talk where the monk holds a fan, somewhat like holds it up like that in front of his face and then gives, gives, gives a talk. And I uh, assume that the Venamanyananda would have been upholding such a fan while he was giving his sermon. End of comment. Even if it is made out of some other material, it will still be called a fan. But if it were used for some other purpose, it could become something else. This way we can understand how existence is dependent on grasping. We began our discussion with the statement that existence is a heap of windings and unwindings. Let us now think of a simple illustration. Suppose a rope or a cord is being made up by winding some strands from either end by two persons. For the strands to gather the necessary tension, the two persons have to go on winding in opposite direction. But for the sake of an illustration, let us imagine a situation in which a third person catches hold of the strands in the middle, just before the other two start their winding. Oddly enough, by mistake, those two start winding in the same direction. Both are unaware of the fact that their winding is at the same time an unwinding. The one in the middle, too, is ignorant that it is his tight grasp in the middle, which is the cause of stress and tension. To all appearances, a cord is being made up, which may be taken as two cords on either side of the one who has his hold on the middle. However, viewed from a distance, for all practical purpose, it is just one cord that is being winded up. To introduce a note of discord into this picture, let us suppose that the man in the middle suddenly lets go of his hold with a twang. Now what happens to the cord? The windings in the same direction from both ends, which make it a cord, immediately get neutralized and the cord ceases to be a cord. Something like the stilling of all preparations and the abandonment of all assets happens at that moment. One realizes, as it is, that no real cord existed at all. The same state of affairs prevails in this world. The impermanence of this world, according to the Buddha, does not affect us so long as there is no grasping on our part. All windings in this world get unwinded immediately. This is the nature of the world. This is what is meant by Udayabhaya, or rise and fall. Now what happens if there is no grasping in the middle, while the winding is going on in the same direction from both ends? No cord at all is made up, even if the two at either end go on winding for aeons and aeons. Why? 
simply because they are winding in the same direction. It is the same in the case of the world. The impermanence we see around us in this world does not affect us by itself. We are affected only when we grasp. It is the grasp in the middle that accounts for the cord, or rather, for whatever has the semblance of a cord. In fact, this is what the whirlings call the world. This is what they take as real. Now, what is the consequence of taking it to be real? If it is real and permanent, whatever is contrary to it is annihilation, the destruction of a real world. Keeping in mind the meaning of the Buddha's dictum, dependent on grasping his existence, upadana padjaya bhavo, if one cares to reflect on this little illustration, one would realize that there is actually nothing real to get destroyed. There is no self or soul at all to get destroyed. As a matter of fact, the impermanence of the world is a process of momentary risings and ceasings. Given the grasping in the middle, that is to say, dependent on grasping is becoming, the other limbs follow suit, namely, dependent on becoming birth, dependent on birth, decay and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair arise. Bhava pachaya jati, jati pachaya jara maranam, sokapari deva dukkha dumana supayasa sambhavanti. It is somewhat like the unpleasant tension caused by the winding in the person who has a grasp at the middle. We have already referred to a short aphorism which sums up the content of the insight of those who realize the fruits of the path, like that of a stream runner, namely, Yang Kinji Samudaya Dhammang Sapbang Tang Niroda Dhammang. Whatever is of a nature to arise, all that is of a nature to cease. It does not seem to say anything significant on the face of it, but it succinctly expresses the plainest conviction a stream winner gets of the innocent process of arising and ceasing in the world. It is as if the one who had his grasp in the middle lets go of his hold for a while through the power of the path moment. It is in the nature of the ordinary whirling to hold on and to hang on. That is why the man who grasps the cord in the middle refuses to let go of his hold in the midst of windings and unwindings, however much hardship he has to undergo in terms of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. For him it is extremely difficult to let go. Until a Buddha arises in the world and proclaims the Dhamma, the world stubbornly refuses to let go. Now if one gives up the tendency to grasp, at least for a short while, by developing the Noble Eightfold Path at its supramundane level, and lets go even for one moment, then one understands as one grasps again that now there is less stress and tension. Personality view, doubt and dogmatic adherence to rules and observances. Sakkaya ditti, michikicca, silabhata paramasa are gone. An unwinding has occurred to some extent. The strengths of the cord are less taut now. One also understands at the moment of arising from that supramundane experience that one comes back to existence because of grasping, because of the tendency to hold on. That this tendency to hold on persists due to influxes and latencies due to unabundant defilements, is also evident to him. This, in effect, is the immediate understanding of the law of dependent arising. It seems, then, that we have here in this simile of the cord a clue to an understanding of the nature of this existence. Worldlings in general, whether they call themselves Buddhists or non-Buddhists, conceive of existence in terms of a perdurable essence as being, somewhat on the, along the lines of the view of heretics. Nibbana is something that drives terror into the worldlings, so long as there is no purification of view. The cessation of existence is much dreaded by them. Even the commentators, when they get down to defining Nibbana, give a wrong interpretation of the word Dhuva. They sometimes make use of the word Sasata in defining Nibbana. 
common sasada means in, uh, permanent end of quote. this is a word that should never be brought in to explain the term nibbana according to them nibbana is a permanent and eternal state only you must not ask us what precisely it is for if we are more articulate we will be betraying our proximity to such use as brahma nirvana what is the secret behind this anomalous situation? It is the difficulty in interpreting the term dhuva, which the Buddha uses as a synonym for nibbana. The true significance of this synonym has not been understood. It means stable or immovable. Of course, we do come across this term in such context as Nichang, Dhuvan, Sasatang, Achavana, Dhammam, permanent, stable, eternal, not liable to passing away, when Brahma gives expression to his conceit of eternal existence. But that is because these terms are more or less related to each other in sense. Then in which sense is Nibbana called Nhuva? in the sense that the experience of Nibbana is irreversible. That is why it is referred to as Achalang Sukham, unshakable bliss. The term Akuppa Chita Vimutti, unshakable deliverance of the mind, expresses the same idea. Sometimes the Buddha refers to Nibbana as Akuppa Chita Vimutti. All other such deliverances are shakable or irritable. As the expression kuppapatichasanti, peace dependent on irritability, implies, they are irritable and shakable. Even if they are unshaken during one's lifetime, they get shaken up at death. The final winning post is the pain of death. That is the critical moment at which one can judge one's own victory or defeat. Before the pain of death, all other deliverances of the mind fall back defeated. But this deliverance, this unshakable deliverance with its let go strategy at the approach of death, gets never shaken. It is unshakable. That is why it is called the bliss unshaken, Achalang Sukkam. That is why it is called stable, Dhuvan. It seems then that some of the terms used by the Buddha as epithets or synonyms of Nibbana have not been correctly understood. Sometimes the Buddha employs words used by heretics in a different sense. In fact, there are many such instances. Now, if one interprets such instances in the same sense as heretics use those words, it will amount to a distortion of the Dhamma. Here too we have such an instance. Unfortunately, the commentators have used the term Sasata to define Nibbana, taking it to be something eternal. The main reason behind this is the misconception regarding existence, that there is an existence in truth and fact. There is this term asmimana, which implies there is the conceit M in this world. All other religious teachers were concerned with the salvation of a real I, or in other words, to confer immortality on this I. The Buddha, on the contrary, declared that what actually is there is a conceit the conceit M. All what is necessary is the dispelling of this conceit. That is why we sometimes come across such references to Nibbana as Samma Man Abhisamaya Antanga Kasi Dukkasa. By rightly understanding conceit, he made an end of suffering. Or Asmi Mana Samukhatang Papunati Dikteva Dhamme Nibbana. One arrives at the real eradication of the conceit M which in itself is the attainment of Nibbana here and now. Comment? You just alternative translation by Vanabhanyana Mori and Bhikkhu Bodhi. With the complete penetration of conceit, he has made an end of suffering. One who perceives no self eradicates the conceit I am, which is Nibbana in this very life. End of comment. Some seem to think that the eradication of the conceit M is one thing and Nibbana another. But along with the eradication of the conceit M comes extinction. Why? 
because one has been winding all this time imagining this to be a real cord or rope. One remains ignorant of the true state of affairs due to one's grasp in the middle. But the moment one lets go, one understands. It is the insight into this secret that serves as the criterion in designating the Aryan according to the number of births he has yet to take in samsara. Thus the stream winner is called Sattakattu Paramo, seven times at the most. With this sudden unwinding which reduces the tension, one understands the secret that the Noble Eightfold Pass is the way to unwinding. One hangs on because one is afraid to let go. One thinks that to let go is to get destroyed. The Buddha declares that the heaviness of one's burden is due to one's grasping. What accounts for its weight is the very tenacity with which one clings to it. This the whirlings do not understand. So they cling on to the rope for fear of getting destroyed. But if one lets go of one's hold, even for a moment, one would see that the tensed strands will get relaxed at least for that moment that there is an immediate unwinding. Full understanding of that unwinding will come when one lets go completely. Then all influxes and latencies are destroyed. So this little verse gives us a deep insight into the problem. What is there to lament? Because there are no notions like I was or I am. There is only a destruction of preparations. The term Vibhava is used in this context in a different sense. It refers here to the destruction of preparations. When using the terms, two terms, bhava and vibhava, some conceive of bhava or existence as a real perdurable essence like a soul and vibhava as its destruction. But here the term vibhava in vibhavisanti refers to the destructions of preparations. There is nothing lamentable about it. In the context of a drama, they are the paraphernalia improvised to stage an act, like the stool and the footstool. When one comes to think of individuals, they are no better than a multitude of puppets manipulated by fetters of existence in accordance with karma. Even in the delivering of this sermon, there is a trace of a puppet show. If the sermon is inspired by the audience, if there is no audience, there is no sermon. We are all enacting a drama. Though for us, this particular act of the drama is so important. There might be similar dramatic acts a few meters away from here in the jungle. A swarm of black ants might be busily hauling away an earthworm breathing in pain. That is one act in their own drama of life. All our activities are like that. It is our unawareness of this framework that constitutes ignorance. If at any time one sees this framework of ignorance, free from influxes and latencies, one gets an unobstructed vision of the world. It is as if the doors of the cinema hall are suddenly flung open. The scene on the screens fades away completely, then and there, as we have described above. Let us now come to the third verse. Suddang dhamma sumpadang suddang sankara santati pasantasu yatha bhutang na bhayan hoti gamani. To one who sees the arising of pure phenomena and the sequence of pure preparations as it is, there is no fear or headman. This verse too has a depth of meaning which we shall now try to elucidate. Why are the phenomena qualified by the word Suddha Dhamma in this context? Because the mind objects which are generally regarded as Dhamma by the world are impure. Why are they impure? Because they are influenced by the influxes. Now here we have uninfluenced or influx-free phenomena. To the Arahant's mind, the objects of the world occur free of influxes. That is to say, they do not go to build up a prepared sankata. They are quasi-preparations. They do not go to build up a film show. If, for instance, one who is seeing a film show 
has the full awareness of the artificiality of those library shots, which go to depict the tragic scene on the screen without being carried away by the latency to ignorance, one will not be able to enjoy in the film show. In fact, the film show does not exist for him. The film show has ceased for him. Similarly, the Arahant sees phenomena as pure phenomena. Those mind objects arise only to cease, that is all. They are merely a series of preparations, Suddhang Sankara Santatim. The film reel is just being played. That is the way it occurs to him. Therefore, to one who sees all this, there is no fear or hidden. Let us try to give an illustration for this, too, by way of an analogy. As we know, when a sewing machine goes into action, it sews up two folds of cloth together. But supposedly suddenly the shuttle runs out of its load of cotton. What happens then? One might even mistake the folds to be actually sewn up, until one discovers that they are separable. This is because the conditions for a perfect stitch are lacking. For a perfect stitch, the shuttle has to hasten and put a knot every time the needle goes down. Now for the Arahant, the shuttle refuses to put in the knot. For him, preparations or sankars are ineffective in producing a prepared or sankata. He has no cravings, conceits and views. For knots of existence to occur, there has to be an attachment in the form of craving, a loop in the form of conceit and a tightening in the form of views. So then the Arahant's mind works like a sewing machine with a shuttle run out of its load of cotton. Though referred to as functional consciousness, its function is not to build up a prepared, since it is influx free. The phenomena merely come up to go down, just like the needle. Why is ignorance given as the first link in the formula of dependent arising? It is because the entire series is dependent on ignorance. It is not a temporal sequence. It does not involve time. That is why the Dhamma is called timeless, of Kalika. It is the stereotype interpretation of the formula of dependent rising in terms of three lives that has undermined the immediate and timeless quality of the Dhamma. Since ignorance is the root cause of all other conditions, inclusive of becoming Bhava, birth, jati, and decay and death, Jaramaranand, that state of affairs immediately ceases with the cessation of ignorance. This, then, is the reason for the last line, na bhayang hoti garmani. There is no fear or hetman. Deathless, amata, means the absence of the fear of death. The fear that the world has about death is something obsessional. It is like the obsessional dread aroused by the sight of an until due to its association with the cobra. As a matter of fact, this body has been compared to an anthill in the Vammika Sutta of the Madhyama Nikaya. This bodily frame, made up of the four elements, procreated by parents and built up with food and drink, is metaphorically conceived as an anthill. The discourse says, take the knife, O wise one, and dig in. The world has the obsession that there is a real cobra of a self inside this anthill. But once it is dug up, what does one find? One discovers an arahant who has realized selflessness, a selfless cobra worthy of honor. Of course, this might sound as a postscript on Vammika Sutta, but the metaphor is so pregnant with meaning that it can well accommodate this interpretation too. The world has a perception of the compact, Ganasanya, with regard to this body made up of the four elements. Because of that very perception or notion of compactness, there is a fear of death. There is birth because there is existence. Now this might, on analysis, give us an insight into the law of dependent arising. The term jati or birth generally calls to mind the form of a child coming out of the mother's womb. But in this context, the Buddha uses the term in relation to bhava or existence which in its turn is related to upadana or grasping. It is at the time we use something as the footstool that a footstool is born. When it has ceased to serve that purpose, the footstool is dead. It is in this sense that all assets, upadi, 
असेट टू बी ऑफ नेचर टू बी बोर्न जहाँ दी धम्मा है ते भिक्कवो भिक्कवे उपनयो ऑल दिस असेट्स मॉन्स आर ऑफ द नेचर टू बी बोर्न नॉट ओनली दी एनिमल ऑब्जेक्ट्स लाइक वाइफ एंड चिल्ड्रन मेन एंड वुमेन स्लेव्स एट्सेट्रा बट इवन गोल्ड एंड सिल्वर आर मेंशन देयर एस द नेचर टू बी बोर्न कॉमन यानी दिस पैसेज इज फ्रॉम आर्या पायेसन सुत्ता एंड द पैरेलल डज नॉट मेंशन बर्थ and uh, to my own knowledge this is the only passage in the pali suttas at least i'm often not aware of another one where birth is used in such a way so this means that the interpretation of birth as uh, in this sense of uh, the nature to be born of various things is only found in the in a pali passage that is not supported by an otherwise fairly similar presentation of this part in this madhyama arama parallel end of comment now let us ponder over this statement how can gold and silver be born how can they grow old they are born because of craving conceit and views they come into existence they are born because of birth they grow old therefore they become objects for sorrow lamentation and the like to arise for one who looks upon them as pure preparations all those objects do not crystallize into things the description of the non manifestative consciousness in the brahman mantanika sutta looks like a riddle in the form of a jumble of negative terms like padavina hosin padaviana hosin padavito na hosin etc i did not claim to be earth i did not claim to be in earth I did not claim to be from her. But what is the general idea conveyed by these expressions? The implication is that the other hand looks upon all those concepts which the worldlings make use of to make up an existence and to assert the reality of this drama of existence as mere pretensions. He is convinced of their vanity and insubstantiality. As we have already explained with the simile of a sewing machine, an existence does not get stitched up or knitted up the cessation of existence is experienced then and there some seem to think that the arahant experiences the nibbanic bliss only after his death but the cessation of existence is experienced here now ditteva dhamme this is something marvelous and unknown to any other religious system it is just at the moment that the shuttle of the sewing machine runs out of its load of cotton that the cessation of existence is experienced it is then that the latencies are uprooted and all influxes are destroyed cravings conceits and views refuse to play their part with the result that mere preparations come up and go down this is the ambrosial deathless It is said that the arans partake of ambrosial deathless, amatang paribhunyanti. What actually happened in the case of the venerable arahant Adimutta was that the bandit chief understood the dhamma and set him free instead of killing him, and even got ordained under him. But even if he had killed him, venerable Adimutta would have passed away experiencing the ambrosial deathless. Why? Because he can let go. before mara comes to grant he is therefore fearless the obsession of fear of death common to worldlings has vanished this then is the ambrosia it is not some medicine or delicious drink for the possession of which gods and demons battle with each other common this is just a reference to an indian myth of the devas and the asuras fighting for the ambrosia and of coming it is that bliss of deliverance the freedom from the fear of death needless to say that it requires no seal of everlastingness as we once pointed out in tune with the two lines of the following canonical verse kinkayara udapane na apache sapadasi what is the use of a well if water is there all the time once the thirst is quenched forever why should one go in search of a well let us now take up the next verse tinna katta samang lokam yadapanyaya passati 
mamattang suwa sangbindang na intimiti na sochuti. Now all these verses are eloquent expressions of poignous sunyata. When one sees with wisdom the entire world, that is both the internal and external world, as comparable to grass and twigs in point of worthlessness, one does not entertain the conceit mind and therefore does not lament, saying, Oh, I have nothing. One is not scared of the term bhavani roda or cessation of existence. Why? Because all these are worthless things. Here too we may add something more by way of explanation, that is, as to how things become things in this world, though this may seem obvious enough. Since we have been so concerned with dramas, let us take up a dramatic situation from the world. A man is hastily walking along a jungle path. Suddenly his foot strikes against a stone. Oh, it is so painful. He kicks the stone with a cross. A few more steps and another stone trips him. This time it is even more painful. He turns round, quietly, picks up the stone, cleans it carefully, looking around, wraps it up in his handkerchief and slips it into his pocket. Both were stones. But why this special treatment? The first one was a mere pebble, but the second one turned out to be a gem. The world esteems a gemstone as valuable because of craving conceits and views. So the first accident was a mishap, but the second a stroke of luck. Now had all these mishaps and haps been filmed, it would have become something of a comedy. Everything in our environment, even our precious possessions like gold, silver, pearls and gems, appear like the paraphernalia improvised for a dramatic performance on the world stage. Once they come on the stage, from backstage, they appear as real things. Not only do they appear as real, relative to the acts of the drama, but they get deposited in our mind as such. It is such deposits that become our aggregates of grasping, or assets, which we take along with us in this sangsara in the form of likes and dislikes. Loves and hates contracted in the past largely decide our behavior in the present with some sort of subconscious acquiescence, so much so that we often form attachment and revengeful aversions in accordance with them. When one comes to think of it, there is something dramatic about it. When something serves as a footstool in a particular act, it is really a footstool. When it is improvised to serve as some other thing in the next act, one is unaware of the fact that it is the same object. One is not aware of the hoodwink involved in it. Such a state of affairs prevails over the nature of preparations, sankaras. Being ignorant of the fact that these are purely preparations, the worldlings take concepts too seriously. To come to conclusions such as I was so and so in such and such a birth, thereby clinging on to all animate and inanimate objects in the world. They are actually comparable to things temporarily improvised to depict a particular scene in a drama or a film show. That is why we compare the four elements to ghosts. Deluded by their ghostly transfigurations, the worldlings create for themselves a perception of form. The verse in question gives us an insight into this particular aspect of the drama of existence. A meditator can get at least an inkling of the emptiness and insubstantiality of this drama of existence when he trains himself in keeping the four postures with mindfulness and full awareness. By practicing it, he gets an opportunity to witness a monodrama free of charge. And this is the drama. When walking, he understands I'm walking. When standing, he understands I'm standing. When sitting, he understands I'm sitting. When lying down, he understands I'm lying down. By keeping one's postures in this manner, one sees in outline one's own form as if one were acting in a monogramma. When the basis of the factors of the form group is removed, those in the name group are reduced to purposeless activations. Earth, water, fire and air constitute the basis of form. 
when the meditator becomes dispassionate with regard to these four elements, when they begin to fade away for him, the factors in the name group assume a ghostly character. He feels as if he is performing a drama with non-existing objects. He opens a non-existing door, sits on a non-existing chair, and so on. <coughs> now, if we try to understand this in terms of an analogy of a drama, as we have been doing throughout, we may compare it to a mime or a dumb show. In a dumb show, we might see such acts as follows. An actor rides a no bike, climbs a no hill, meets a no friend and has a no chat with him. Or else he may sit on a no chair by a no table and writes a no letter with a no pen. What we mean by the no nose here is the fact that on the stage there is neither bicycle nor hill nor another person nor any other object like a chair, a table or a pen. All these are merely suggested by his acting. This kind of dumb show has a comic effect on the audience. As an inside meditator too goes through a similar experience when he contemplates on name and form, seeing the four elements as empty and void of essence, which will give him at least a yota of the conviction that this drama of existence is empty and insubstantial. He will realize that, as in the case of the dumb show, he is involved with things that do not really exist. This amounts to an understanding that the factors of the name group are dependent on the form group and vice versa. Seeing the reciprocal relationship between the name and form, he is disinclined to dabble in concepts or grip down a dose of prescriptions. If form is dependent on name and name is dependent on form, both are void of essence. What is essential here is the very understanding of essencelessness. If one sits down to draw up lists of concepts and prescribe them, it would only lead to a mental constipation. Instead of release, there will be entanglement. Such a predicament is not unlikely. Comment. Yes, the main point I uh, suggest I have identified the freedom of the Arahant's mind, which stands in continuity with the discussion of the Anidasana Vijnana in the last sermon and in this sermon is exemplified in particular by the verses on Adimutta, by the venerable Adimutta.